it doesn't matter. Um, but what we do know is that, um, you know, we don't actually know Matthew's past. We don't know the person he was. All we know is the role he played in society and that he was called and that he followed that call. And I think that's pretty interesting because what we are given is really um, the construct of society and the role he played in it, not the person. And then with the calling of Jesus, we're given the person. We're given that transition. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other cast in this story. Um, Enter the Pharisees. Stage left. The ultra-concerned leaders, um, very, very um, into preserving the order through devotion to the law. Don't wash your hands one time, wash your hands seven to make extra, extra sure that you are clean. Um, they were, they, they were adherent to the law, but also, if you start, again, going back to that concept of the social construct of the time, the law had become a way in which they had established their self, their self. You know, we really see that evolution along the way. But right now it is Jesus speaking when he says, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize I, I came for the well, for the holy, for the righteous. And I don't imagine Jesus had no shame to comment on the accusing of tax collectors. I mean, this is a really common thing to get caught up in, and I'm not saying he was probably not in the picture, but in my mind, that's what I get. And then he says something that I think is really, really important for us to keep in mind. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now, remember what we just talked about with the Pharisees being ultra-adherent to the law, and as a result of that, basically forming their own construct around the law, in which they have risen to the top of this social hierarchy. Um, maybe the conditions are very different than what we're dealing with today, but I don't think the idea is really all that different. Um, now, what's interesting, though, about the law is that the law was intended to be a conduit where one could be made right with God through the law. But flip that on its head and shows us that that was not working the way that it was intended is because here we have the Pharisees basically calling Jesus and his disciples out for being with the marginalized. There was no access to righteousness for these sinners and tax collectors because of who they were in society in the eyes of the Pharisees. So keep that in mind. When Jesus says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, that is a direct commentary on how the law had been turned and formed into another way in which some group becomes powerful and some group is on the outside. in the back of your mind, because what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these stories, and we're basically going to take them in with them, and we're going to pull them into a collective noun. So that's one. Now we're going to go on ahead and move on to the story within the story, which is the hemorrhagic woman. So we have this story about the synagogue leader, and so go on ahead and pair that out. That's going to be our third story, and we're going to basically go right into the second story, okay? This story within a story occurs as Jesus is being taken to the daughter of a synagogue leader. And what's happened to her is that she has been hemorrhaging for 12 years. Okay. There are a number of different actual
natural medical reasons that most of which we will no longer understand, thanks to modern medicine, why this could have occurred. But what you do need to know is that someone who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years, that means that this woman has spent 12 years not only with a medical condition that would have probably been pretty awful, but also she has been deemed ritually unclean for 12 years by her community. So through no fault of her own, this woman is not only in a bad way physically, but she has also been marginalized by her community. If she is ritually unclean, she would not be cleansed to participate in the fullness of that community, including people would not want to touch her. It was very, very, very... Um, particular about cleansing rituals and the ability to actually touch somebody. And so this woman was, was totally marginalized and, in, and suffering, physically and emotionally. And that's rough. This tiny story within the story, there's a lot there that the law had marginalized her, society had marginalized her. This woman is desperate, and she sees Jesus walking along, and she does the one thing that she can do. She reaches out. She is the unclean, has decided, well, no one's going to reach out to me. I am going to reach out. If I just touch the fringe of his cloak, I will be made well. That is how strong her belief was in this one desperate chance to be made whole again. Not just physically, but whole as a person within her community. And what does Jesus do? He turns and he says, your faith has already made you well. The reality that she was able to perceive the possible beyond the current, that total belief based, frankly, out of desperation. We have no reason to believe that she had some sort of, um, you know, amazing intellect or, you know, some, some call. She just knew she had faith in that moment that this is my one shot. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't recoil. He doesn't give her a big sermon or anything like that. He says, your faith has already made you well. And she was well. Think about what that meant to her. This story within the story, it's funny because, you know, we talk about it, and I'm, I'm a science person, and so I always kind of think about, like, the medical implications. But can you imagine what it would have been like to be on the outs for 12 years? To be suffering, to be alone, to be unclean, we know nothing else about this woman besides the fact that she had enough faith to reach out just for the fringe of his cloak to be made well and to be made whole again. And of course, Jesus answers in the way that Jesus does. And now we get to the story outside the story. The synagogue leader and his daughter. And you know, it's funny because I... I talked to folks during the 8 o'clock service and, you know, talked about this exact topic. And I'm really not, I'm not really convinced that I have fully digested this one in the way that I thought I had. And that is mostly because I don't know who really is the center of this story besides Jesus. You know, is this the leader? Is this the daughter? I mean, really, ultimately, does it matter? No, probably not, because it's Jesus that does all of the things. Um, but I think that this is a really fascinating story, and it's one that I have never read included with other texts. So I, I feel like this week has really been just a blessing to me to think about this in a new way. Okay, so going back to this, the story outside the story. So a leader of the synagogue comes to Jesus asking for help. His daughter has died, and he wants Jesus to revive her. Okay, there are two points in that very short statement in which our world is totally turned upside down. And it's funny to think, for starters, that in the midst of this death, the person that is a leader of the synagogue comes to Jesus. Not only does he come to Jesus, he comes to a sinner, a tax collector's dinner for Jesus, steps off of his social pedestal as a leader within a synagogue. That would have been someone with a lot of influence. Walks himself to the dinner of a sinner and a tax collector, that association, and asks Jesus for help. Not only does he ask Jesus for help, he is desperate for the impossible. Truly desperate. And I can tell you right now, as a parent, I would do the exact same. 
And it's incredible how these people are all being pushed to the very, very basis of their being, beyond what society has assigned them to be, beyond what the social construct of the, of the time has told them who they are. You are a tax collector. You are unclean. You are important. At the end of this, their desperation, their humanity has reduced them to something more, a little less of them and a little more openness to the blessings and the miracles of Jesus Christ. And so obviously at this time, Jesus has already started to develop some notoriety. Um, but here we have a leader acknowledging the power of Jesus, as well as that desperate plea from a loving father to just suspend reality for a minute, to do the completely impossible, not just in the construct of their society, but in the construct of our reality. And then we have another piece of the cast of this story, and this is the people. So what are, when Jesus gets to the leader's home, what are the people doing? Well, the people, or the general cast, are gathered, and they laugh at the idea that Jesus could revive her. It is totally beyond their, their understanding, even their imagination of the possible that this could actually happen. But what does Jesus do? He simply says, she was just sleeping. Takes her hand. He physically reaches out and takes her hand. Again, that physical, that interaction in this very real way. He didn't do it from some other guy's house. He came in again and made that interaction. He takes her hand and she's awakened. And I like to call this the low-key resurrection in which we've got this, you know, little one line dropped here where Jesus is bringing someone back from the dead. Is this the resurrection? No, but this is pretty incredible. This is an incredible miracle that happened. Um, and at that point, word spreads throughout the district. I promise you that if somebody walked into the mayor's house and brought his daughter back from the dead, um, that would probably spread. I do not think that this is just an Israel thing. I think this is an everywhere thing. This is one of those places where we turn the corner, where somebody who is incredibly important has stepped off their pedestal and acknowledged that this is something more. This is something realer than our real. And so these three stories, these three individuals, and really it's four individuals because the daughter, I mean, has a part to play in this. She was dead and now she lives. All really unique, but we've got one Jesus here that undoes the construct of what is possible. And we see these three individuals, and really these four individuals, that are captive in the role that they play in this reality, the reality of where we are and how we perceive it as humans. We have the tax collector and the sinner, we have the unclean woman, and we have the powerful man mourning his lost daughter. These roles are written by the construct of this world and its society, but really nothing more than that. Because in all of these cases, Jesus flips the narrative on its head with a new reality. How often are we the ones writing that old reality? How often are we, the cast, defining each of these individuals as something less, as something different? How often are we making a them when we could be making an us. So one thing that I don't think we appreciate in these short scenes is that Jesus took another and made something beautiful. Jesus took an outsider, a despised one, that apparently was ready to, that was apparently ready to answer a call others struggled with and became a great evangelist in Matthew. Jesus answered the desperate attempt of the woman with healing restoring her to fullness, both physically and then also within her community. And then lastly, and this is the one that really gets me, is that he answered the desperate plea of something more than just a leader in the synagogue. It was a father. For Jesus to conquer death, that his child might live. He came to Jesus, not the leadership that was, for that chance a chance at the realm of the impossible, and that it might be 
just a bit more possible. And within this, the framework of this society, the very construct of this world, is no longer the last word. In all of these cases, not this time. And in these beautiful moments, I feel if we want to pull this back forward, that our humanity is very much in this text. The never-ending tension of who and what we are in a story that is so much bigger than us. We are both the perpetrators of this reality. And also, we are often what it marginalizes. And Jesus is the answer to both. So what are we going to do with this? How do we become more than the people who always say, eh, that's just the way things are, as a weak attempt to absolve our part of the ways in which our collective society, society is so quick to make another rather than whole? And also, it's an excuse for the ways in which we, personally and collectively, aren't fully living into the reality of the resurrection. And you know, the funny thing is, it doesn't take long looking at or talking about these big picture questions before we can make a laundry list of forces at work against us being better, that just, it's, it's just too, too hard, too much. Pride, ego, greed, sin, love of power, love of money. But you know, I really think, if we really want to be a little bit more honest with ourselves, um, I think the thing that really fuels much of this is fear. Fear paralyzes us in our alternate reality of thinking, our here and now. This idea that we can control the world through order, through power, through money, through building a society in which some are comfortable while others are on the fringe. And this alternate reality in which Jesus has broken the bonds of sin. I need us all to understand that, if you take anything from this, that we live in an alternate reality that is not the true reality. Because Jesus has broken the bonds of sin. He has suffered, he has died, he was resurrected, he walked among his disciples, he ascended into heaven, he gave them and he gave us the Great Commission, and we do live in a world, in an actual reality, in which the fire of the Holy Spirit descended at Pentecost and made us able to go out into this world and to understand people at exactly where they are, for who they are, no babble necessary. And I ask you this question. What are you so afraid of? What are we afraid of? Where are the places in which you personally, your core identity hangs on a construct that is very much your own fear, your adherence to the old, rather than God's ability to be greater than it? And what happens when Jesus calls and blows all that away? What lives are we called to? What mysteries are we called to live into? when the sinners and the social pariahs are healed and made well? And what new reality are we being called to when our Savior conquers death? And just remember, Jesus calls busy folks. Don't think for a second that your mending and your tending is going to keep the call of the Holy Spirit out, because it is not. Jesus called to Matthew, hey, follow me. And Matthew left his booth. Leave your booth. Leave your identity, if that identity is anything less than the follower of Jesus that gets up when he calls. And maybe you don't need to physically get up and walk out, but you know, maybe you do. But maybe for most of us, this means asking God on a daily basis to be less of us. The old, the afraid, the desperate person clinging to a tired system out of fear, and more of a place for the Holy Spirit to work in us and throughout the world. Less of us, more of God. And it's a better identity. And it's a realer reality. And when you see things a bit more for what they are rather than what we've tried to make them, it is that much more genuine. And let's do this work. Not just individually, but collectively. Let's do this work. Let's spend our lives rooting out those things that keep us from being more, from making the world a little bit more whole in our small ways. Let's not just cut the tops off the weeds in our soul. Let's actually do the work and let's dig them out, root and stem. Even if it takes more time, we need to do that work. 
And in today's gospel, we are given three instances in which the reality constructed by this world wasn't everything. It was not the whole story. We see a tax collector turned evangelist. We see a woman that was considered unwell and unclean healed. And a desperate father that witnessed a miracle as his daughter was revived from death. The common themes are the same in all of these stories. People for whom reality had pushed them to a margin, to desperation, and a Jesus that brings a new reality to conquer it all. And as we live into this gospel, we live into the end of this story and the beginning of a new one, and we know that these stories are only a piece of the glory to come through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that the world has been turned upside down, and the construct of here and now is being changed as we are called by the Holy Spirit to live into that calling and to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. And so I ask you again, as you leave this place today as the hands and feet of God, a small piece of bringing and living into that kingdom, that renewal of the us rather than the them mindset, what are we so afraid of? Amen. As a redeemed people, part of the work that we do is not with just our hands and our feet, but collectively it is with our tithes and offerings. And so at this time, we are going to, um, we are, are going to move into our tithes and author- offerings and then into our time of prayer. But there are a couple of different ways that you can give here at Memorial. You can text GIVE to 73256. All right. And then put Memorial UMC in the number in the text message. You can also just write a check, put it in the plate, um, or you can go online and give through Realm. So as we take this time to listen to this beautiful music, let's think about the ways in which we can give more to our God.
we enter into our prayers of the people, a reminder that each week we send out an email with that prayer list at the bottom. You can let us know in the office if you'd like to receive that list to pray alongside the whole community. You can also uh, let us know if there's something you'd like to add to that prayer list so that we can pray with and, and for those things that are on your hearts and minds. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Ron is at annual conference, uh, and this is annual conference season, so every conference in the U.S. has their meetings in the next month or so or the previous month. Uh, and this year, with everything going on, that also means that there are churches disaffiliating during these annual conferences uh, for, for various reasons. Um, so I invite you to remember them in your prayers, that, that we pray for them to be fruitful in ministry. Uh, in whatever form that looks like for them, uh, and then to pray for those of us who remain United Methodists, uh, that we may also be fruitful in ministry and continue to grow in the call that God has for us. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you have called each one of us, that like with Matthew, you have asked us to follow you. Help us to be a people who follows after you with ease, and by listening to your spirit. We pray your blessings on your church, universal. That in its various expressions, you may help us to be a people who draw others closer to you. That we may be known for what we're for, rather than what we're against. Help us to be a people who represent you well in this world, that your spirit would fill us. And that it would lead us to love you, and to love others, through acts of Worship, devotion, compassion, and justice. And so together, God, we pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven. surrounded on every side can't see the light of the day but I am persuaded beyond all hope you won't let go of me I stake my claim on every word you say
a few announcements as we send you out this week. Uh, first, a reminder that our baptism study that Pastor Ron's going to lead on what do we as United Methodists believe specifically about the sacrament of baptism starts this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. It'll be in the parlor right out behind those doors. Uh, and there is a book that you'll need, so the information for that is in the back of your bulletin along with lots of other things that are coming up. So I invite you to join us for that. Also, on the 30th at the end of this month, We'll have our variety show and dinner. The dinner is going to be catered by Carl Berthelot, uh, Carl's Kitchen, and so he'll be bringing in pasta and all that, uh, and then join us for an evening of entertainment, or if you have a, a talent to share with us, you can sign up to do so as well. And uh, finally, a ministry I want to highlight this week is our Mums Cafe. So here in this room every Wednesday at 5.30, we host a free meal for anybody in the community. Uh, so one, we invite you to come join us to sit with people that you don't know, talk to them, uh, build some community, uh, but also a reminder that in that same email with our prayer list, there's a shopping list each week. So if you can't be a part of Mums by your presence, you might be able to help by picking up an extra item off that shopping list and bringing it to provide for those uh, who come to the meal. And Sam will lead us in our benediction. Go from this place, um, willing to live into the full reality of the resurrection, and willing to do the work. Less of us, more of God. Amen.